All right. The old saying, everybody has a podcast now. Rob Lowe, trying to prove that that's true. You're finally <laughs> here. You finally have your own podcast. You made, made it. it. You made it with all the other podcasters. Yeah. I, I, I base my career on going backwards. Um, <laughs> I, I, I started out as a movie star and then I went to television and then I just, then I became an author and then I went out on the road with my comedy act and then I went and now I have a podcast. So I believe in going backwards in my, it works for me. That's just, that's all I'm saying. What's going to be the angle for the podcast, which dropped this week. Yeah. It, my first, my first episode is out. It's, uh, it's Chris Pratt he is my guest. And it's the reason I wanted to get into it in all seriousness was that I've enjoyed being on other people's podcasts so much because you can, you know, this is the last place where you can have a true conversation, um, freewheeling and there's no structure. And I always loved that when I was a kid on watching that on, on television interviews, but that that's not the, the genre anymore. And the diversity of people that I know in terms of having been in the business for so long and the stories, it's like, no one's going to talk to Gwyneth Paltrow the way I yeah. am. She, she crashed in my wife and I's guest bedroom when she was 18, trying to get an agent. Yeah. You know, no one's going to talk to Pratt the way I, I do when I was like, bro, you got to slim down and you're going to be a big movie star. So, um, you know, I just did magic Johnson for week number two. and when he and I got into our deep dive on the Showtime era, it was, I mean, no one, no, you know, no one has that perspective um, just because I, because I lived it with him. So it's been really fun, by the way. I got a blast. Good. I'm glad you're doing it. Um, yeah. You were, so you've been one of the hardest people to book for this podcast, <laughs> dating back to Grantland. And, it's so and, crazy. Uh, I, there's so much to talk to you about. I don't even know where to start because I grew up. I grew up with your movies. Yeah, you're a little older than I am, but like, like you know, you come in in the early '80s. That's right when I'm an only child watching everything. Oh um, boy! I'll talk about whatever you want to talk about, but can we deep dive the '80s? Can we just yeah, do it? we need to do it, dude. That's listen, great. This is why I love being on podcasts because there's no rules. Great. Uh, and you covered some of this in your book, but one of the things I love about um, your whole arc especially those first few years is you're in this generation and it's all these dudes. It's Sean Penn and Tom Cruise and you, a, a few of you end up together in the outsiders, but you all know each other. And that that's the part like, and you covered this in your book and some of it's been covered in different magazine features, but it's a real class when you, it's almost like if you're using sports terms where like with the NBA, where you'd be like, oh, the, the mid eighties, like Jordan and Barkley and all these guys, and they all came in together. Your thing for whatever reason was a class. What was it just sheer coincidence or was there more going on than that? That this many actors all knew each other when, before they became famous. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think it, it to me, it's a little bit about like what happens in the music business where you go, wow, wait a minute in Laurel Canyon. The birds were living next door to the monkeys. Yeah. And Neil Young was in the basement above Jackson Brown and Glenn Fry was like the pizza delivery man or whatever. Like that's what it was. Um, I think in the sort of eighties, you know, Santa Monica, Malibu um era. So we did we did all know each other and we're all fighting for the same roles and being competitive and then helping each other with auditions. And, um, I don't think that goes on so much any, anymore. I really don't. So you have, it's you, it's Sean Penn, it's Emilio Estevez or Sean Penn, maybe a little, is he a tiny bit older or is he considered yeah, part of that crew? He's a little bit older, but yeah, no, he, he lived, you know, three streets down. So it's the, Chris Penn, Sean Penn, Emilio, Charlie, Robert Downey Jr., um, Cruz moves, moves to California and now all of a sudden he's in the outsider. So he's in that mix. Yeah. Cruz moves uh, out to Malibu cause he had just done taps, uh, with Sean and Tim and, and Tim Hutton, who has to be included in this too. Cause he Tim, got ordinary people. Yeah. Tim's living in the colony, getting all the girls, <laughs> getting all the roles. Wait, all right. So what, let's get, let's hit that. So Tim, so Tim Hutton gets ordinary people, wins the Oscar. And moves right to Malibu Colony? Yeah. Playing, playing pickup basketball out there in the street. I remember it like it was yesterday. 
And where are you living at the time? You haven't you haven't had your break yet. I'm living at home. I'm living in my parents' garage. I've converted the garage into, you know, a a 19-year-old's paradise. Big color TV, a little bit of privacy, some set of weights, you know. (laughs) (laughs) And that's an amazing time to be in California, too, because they're filming all the stuff there. Yeah. Um, Yeah. When I moved to California, I was was 13, and uh, we would go out on the you know, the school playground and there'd be a dog fight of Navy World War II Corsairs dive bombing over the school and they'd be filming that TV show, Baba Bob Black Sheep. Oh yeah. Or you Bob go Conrad. To, Bob Conrad, knock this off my shoulder. Yeah. Um, or you'd go down to the beach and they'd be filming Charlie's Angels and there'd be Farrah Fawcett in that amazing bikini. I mean, I, it was really, really a, a magical. Oh, oh, I remember driving through Malibu one day and, and, and seeing a movie company at the end of the Malibu pier. And, you know, I was young and wanted to be an actor and I didn't know anything about it. I was from Ohio. So I wanted to go and see what they were shooting. And it was the incredible Hulk. And, wow. uh, it was, it was just so fun to see all that stuff. I was an only child growing up just outside of Boston. All of these shows yep. were in California, including battle of the network stars, which was filmed at Pepperdine, which seemed like, I, I didn't even know how is this in the United States? They would do the wide shot. Cosell would do right outside Malibu. Like, and it would be like, wow, that's in the United States. Where is this? The Battle of the Network Stars was a highlight of my life. Oh, yeah. A, a I loved watching it on TV. And, and I think it started the year or two before I moved to California. So when I 76. got to. Yes, perfect. So when I got there, I'd seen it on TV. And now I'm there. And I'm watching you know, Christy McNichol from family, who was always the MVP, <laughs> right? She was yeah. like, they would turn her loose on the obstacle course. But Mark Harmon out of UCLA, the former quarterback, Mark Harmon and, you know, uh, Farah was there, Lee Majors. And they took it really seriously. That's what I loved about it. Like they were not fucking around at all. And it always came down to the tug of war. Remember that? Oh yeah. I, it was my favorite show. And one of the greatest sports moments of my childhood was when Gabe Kaplan beat Robert Conrad in the race. And I remember I just had this hazy memory of it, but really distinct, but you know, it was, and then YouTube came around and I'm like, Oh, at some point this is going to come on YouTube. And then it finally did. And it was better than I remembered. I wrote a whole column about it for ESPN.com. It was like one of the great underdog wins of my life. Cause it just seemed like no. Conrad was going to smoke him, but you forget he's smoking like seven packs of Marlboro Reds at the time. So and Gabe, Gabe Kaplan has got that, yeah, that big gate. He's got those long yeah. legs. He just, he just murdered him. Yeah. So, I, so I re- it really did matter back then. It was good. Sh- it was really good stuff. I mean, I have a, there's an online photo floating around of me in bright red dolphin shorts with no shirt. And I was like fifth, you were know, like fifteen, and I was so thin. I literally look like I've I've been on the Bataan Death March with my dolphin shorts at the Battle of the Network Stars, watching it. It's it's a humiliating photo. I highly wow. recommend everybody Google it right now. Um, it's humiliating, but that's me at the Battle of the Network Stars, and it was. I thought I was looking so fly. God, did you? Were you on a TV show at any point there? Or did you go right to movies? I did a TV show. Almost immediately after that moment in, in my life, well, I, when I was 15, I got a sitcom on ABC called A New Kind of Family. And it was two women and their family sharing the same house, which then became a big hit. And later on, on a show called Kate and Alley. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, that was. By, and apparently it was like some associate producer on our show stole the idea and made it a hit because ours was a bomb. Ours was a bomb and noteworthy. Only in that, um, I remember that there were 62 shows on all of television because we were always number 62. We were dead last Ooh. because we were opposite 60 Minutes, which is the number one show at the time. Yeah. Disaster. And um, one, in one of the great moments, the, the other, it was a disaster. The ratings were terrible. Nobody knew what to do. They shut us down for a week. And when we came back, the other family had been fired with no explanation whatsoever and replaced 
um, with Toma Hopkins and Janet Jackson. And so I got Jesus. to know, I got to know Janet when she was a 13 year old actress. And I remember her going, man, this acting thing is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of gravitate to the music. Yeah. So then the, the outsiders happens, which was a legendary book when I was growing up and when you were growing up too. Still Cold is uh, one of the, one of the things I love is that every year there's a new um, crop of seventh grade um, folks who have to read the book because it's in the curriculum across the United States, and they get introduced to that sh that movie and they fall in love with the eighteen year old versions of Tom Cruise and me and Matt Dillon and and uh, it's fun to walk down the street and have you know still have like a, a fourteen year old go oh my god. Soda Pop Curtis. Seriously. Well, it was, it was that, it was Tex and it was Rumblefish. That was S.E. Hinton. Those were the very, three books. Very, and you, very. You read all of there's them. There's one more. There's one more you're missing. Which one? That was then, this is now. Oh, that was a great one. Yeah. Right? So yep. for whatever reason, The Outsiders, I, I mean, they made three movies out of those four. I don't think they made that was then this is now as a movie. If they, if they, they did, I don't they, remember it. They did. They did make it. It was um, directed by, I think, the same guy who directed Tex. But notably, it was the first thing that Emilio Estevez ever wrote. He adapted oh. it and wrote it. There you go. Well, The Outsiders, legendary. That was the best of all the books. Coppola yeah. is involved. He has the most juice he's ever going to have. He's coming off Apocalypse Now. Two Godfathers. And yeah. it's really funny reading... Does that, there's been a couple of great magazine pieces about it over the years about how he really was like, I want to find the next generation of people. And he goes out and the cast ends up having you and Swayze and Emilio Estevez, and Tom Cruise, and Diane Lane, all these people. But this must have been in your circles, like the all time dream. I have to get this role. Everybody you knew was trying to go for it, right? There's never been a movie like it, certainly in my experience, in terms of so plum and with with a director behind it like you allude to at that moment in time there was nobody who even could compare to francis coppola nobody yeah and um all the parts were great you know you didn't even know what part you wanted they were all so great and francis didn't know what part he wanted you for because you would one day i'd read pony boy and i'd come back and audition and then i'd read dallas and then i'd read soda pop curtis and um, the, the, the sort of kill or be killed casting sessions that we used to have, or we have to watch each other do it. Um, that none, none of, none of that has ever happened since. Um, it was, it was an amazing, amazing time. I left out Macho and see Thomas Howell too. Oh yeah. I mean, he really did. He really did kind of achieve what he wanted to achieve at the time. Like I want this movie to be remembered as this movie that launched all of these careers. And it was like, well, that kind of happened. And it's not the first time he'd done it. Um, yeah. Godfather. He, you know, you look at the Godfather cast, um, you look at the cast of Apocalypse Now, you look, uh, you know, the other thing is Francis had a producing partner named Fred Roos, who did all of Francis's movies. And Fred really was responsible for the casting. Truly, he was. Yeah. And Fred also did all of those movies I just mentioned, but he also did American Graffiti. So if you add the American Graffiti cast, yeah. To this litany of people, it's really, really extraordinary. Did did you know your life was going to change? Yeah, everybody, everybody who was in that movie knew. We, um, the, the 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 movie was just too high profile not to change our lives. You know, I'd never done a movie, so to star in a Coppola movie, I mean, by definition, your life's changed immediately. I think what what's funny looking back on it for me though is that we all thought the movie would do better than it did. It did fine. It did fine. It was a success, but it was not a monster. Yeah. It wasn't. And I think we would have thought the movie would do better and maybe we wouldn't. And it turns out that as actors, we all did way better for way longer than the movie ever did. And that I don't think we saw coming. That was a weird time for movies because there was a lot of movies based around teenagers and young adults. And it, and it just, yeah. And, and I even look at 83, 84, 85, it's just a slew. That's when a lot of the great high school movies, John Hughes, um, yeah. Karate Kid, all those type of movies, 
on and on and on. And it just seemed like people went from that movie to the next one, all the right moves. Cruz was in all the right moves. I think the same year. And there was just dozens of them. And, uh, I'm with you. I, when it was coming out, it felt like it was going to be the biggest movie in the world. Um, was there a moment like a before and after moment before the movie came out and after where you're like, you're still a normal person. Nobody knows who the fuck you are. And then the movie comes out and you're like, Oh my God, this is now different. It's all, it started before the movie came out. I remember vividly showing, listen, I, I, in high school, I was look. I don't, I don't want to pretend that I didn't have girlfriends. I did, but I wasn't the cool guy. Yeah. Um, the hot girls had no interest in me at all. Uh, they wanted the football players, the beach volleyball players, the Santa Monica high school. Um, and acting in those days still was kind of like what theater nerds did. And I'm, I'm using the, the euphemism they used to describe me was worse than theater nerd. Yeah. You can imagine what that would be. Um, so I didn't have any real game at all. And I remember showing up to Tulsa to the uh, location first time away from my parents. I'm 17. I'm going to turn 18 on the movie, but I'm 17. And the word had got Matt had already Dylan had already shot Tex there. And Matt was always he was sort of a star already. Teen idol yeah. star. My bodyguard. So, yeah, my bodyguard. And so the you know he'd been there for a, a month and like the girls knew and it had become kind of a thing and i i'll never forget walking into the lobby of the hotel fresh off of you know santa monica high school theater nerd life and they had police barricades to keep the screaming girls away and i remember matt walking down the barricade and looking at one girl and pointing at her and she ducked under the barricade and left her friends immediately and walked up the elevator with Matt and turned. And I'll never forget the look she turned around and gave her friends. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. And the look was like, Oh my fucking God, can you believe this? And I, and like it was yesterday, I went, I, the light bulb went on in my head. I went, Oh, so this is what it's like. And that was what it was like. That's been what it's like for Matt Dillon for probably four decades. Yeah. He's, he's still single and doing his thing. So, he's he's is, like, He's the he's legendary the bachelor. Yeah. Go. Um, so then you go, you make class, which yep. you're not going to believe this. I watched six days ago with my 12 and a half year old son and my 15 year old daughter. I fast forwarded. I knew what part to fast forward. The premise of that movie, my kids didn't know it was going to happen for the people listening. The premise is you're rooming with Andrew McCarthy at a boarding school. He goes into Chicago one weekend, has an affair with Jacqueline Bissett, who's your mom. And then everybody kind of finds out an hour in. And as it happened, my daughter, when it's revealed, my daughter was like, wait a second, this, can this happen? How old is it? And she's asking all these questions. And it's kind of amazing. The movie got made. I was like, no, no, I think he was 18. Um, they made it. They, it's the ultimate MILF movie before the phrase MILF totally. was invented. Totally. She was, I mean, Jacqueline Bissett, I mean, she well, was leg, all time were, legend, all time legend. They wanted me to play the Andrew McCarthy part originally. And I thought just for me, I thought that the Skip Burroughs part was just more fun. He was just a yeah. belligerent, badass, jerk, funny, didn't give a shit. Um, and so I ended up playing that part. And uh, Jackie, who is, was amazing. We just used to laugh. She was very uptight about having a son my age on right. on screen. Um, and she was just so beautiful. And one of the first like real true stars that I ever worked with, you know, and uh, Andrew and I were, we did it in, in Chicago and we just had full run of that city. We had so much fun. Those movies were so fun to make. Oftentimes the the, the making of the movies were were more fulfilling than the actual movies. Right. Well, and then you also, John Cusack was in that movie and Alan Ruck. There, yeah, so it's Cusack, like a lot of people. Yeah, so Cusack and Ruck were really interesting. There's always been a great history of great actors coming out of Chicago and people working in Chicago because so much stuff is shot there. And uh, Cusack had a part with, I think, two or three lines, that's it. He was always going to be like the third guy in the background of a bunch of scenes. He was so funny. His ad libs were so hilarious that 
they just kept giving him more and more and more and more and more stuff to do. But that part was never meant to be anything. He was just right. genius at it. And then the other thing people forget about a little piece of trivia is when in the scene where I walk in and find uh, Andrew in bed with my mom. Yeah. I'm with a date and the date I'm with has, is has one scene. And I remember, so she's a background artist. That's what they call them. They're the people who come in for one day and leave. And they brought a bunch of them out for me to pick which one I thought would my character would want to date. And I picked uh, uh, this beautiful actress, and that was Lolita Davidovich. Oh, my God. star in Blaze and all of these movies. So, so if you watch that, see, that's Lolita Davidovich that I bring into that little sequence. And Virginia Madsen's in the movie, too. And she's another one. She was another one that, you know, we were all just starting off and uh, nobody right. would have known. It was a really fun era because they just started making boarding school movies for like four or five years. And it was just this weird boarding school run. It was that, a fetish. Uh, it was yeah, like boarding, really. boarding school sex fetish movies. I mean, <laughs> totally. is there, I thought the whole thing about boarding school was there was no sex at boarding school. Right. Yeah. So Not it was movies. that. It was that trend, but then there was also that trend of like horny teenagers trying to get laid, and it was like out of that Porky's era. Oh, and a so lot, you have all a this. lot of movies. A lot of movies where, where where girls were forced to ride horseback with no tops on. It was right. I've never it was seen weird. anything like it. Yeah, because really Cruz weird. Cruz was in losing it, where they go oh. to Mexico to try to lose their virginity. But then honestly, you go back and there's like 10, 11 movies like that. So then, all right, so you go from there. Now you're a star, Hotel New Hampshire. Which was talk about John a movie Irving. That would, you would never get made today. That movie would never get made, and it was, um, you know, when when they were making that movie, Tim Hutton, my nemesis, was the original um, actor who was doing it with Elizabeth McGovern. It was their follow up to Ordinary People. Yeah, and then the movie fell apart, and when it was recast, I got the part, and um, you know, it was it it was the, the first movie that I was ever a part of that had this. Um, Liter literary pe uh, pedigree to it that you know could have been like an Oscar movie. The level of seriousness. It was not a teen movie. It was an adult. It was a John Irving book. It was a big deal. And the movie is just so bizarre. Um, and it it came out the, the same day as a little movie called Splash. <laughs> and I'll let you do the math. You can see a young Tom Hanks with Daryl Hannah as a mermaid in a comedy or see me and Jodie Foster in a movie about brother, sister incest with Nastasia Kinski in a bear suit. You tell me what you're going to go watch on a Friday night. Yeah, it was, it was a little too weird, but it was coming off world according to Garp, which I always, I really liked that movie. So, and Irving was a huge author at the time. And you think like, well, they pulled it off with Garp and that, funny. One, that movie was too weird. And it, but it's really funny as Irving for years would tell you, that um, his favorite adaptation of his books was Hotel New Hampshire. Really? Yeah. Um, I think Cider House Rules probably w w came later and was a better a better version. But but at that point, he 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 was he, he was not a, a giant Garp fan. Although that movie was way more successful than Hotel New Hampshire. I really like but that I, movie. I will say, like looking back on that movie, um, I, I'm I'm I. I'm I'm really proud of of that movie. Um, as weird as it is, um, and just in terms of the performances, Jodie Foster is so good in it. And and I I thought that I got to do some 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 kind of the type of work that that young actors didn't get a chance to do at that era. Really, were you seeing two Oscars for her when you were working with her? Were you like someday two Oscars? It wouldn't, her have way. it wouldn't have surprised me. What would surprise me is that she would stay in the business long enough to do it because Jody was so smart, still is, and has so many interests going on outside of acting and, and really sees acting with a gimlet-eyed view of what it really is and isn't. She's under no illusions. So uh, the notion that she would still be uh, entertained and engaged enough to still be doing it to get to Oscars would have been the rub. But um, the the... The level of talent. I mean, there's nobody like her. She, you know, she's my kind of actor where she, you know, suffers no fools, totally gets it, realizes she's not curing cancer, isn't navel gazing about quote unquote her character. We'll talk to you about where you want to go to get dinner afterwards and they'll yell action. And then she will throw the living fuck down 
then they all cut and she'll go right back to her conversation. Um, your next four movies are very important to me and everyone who grew up in the eighties. It's a murderer's row. First, we're starting with Oxford blues. Oh boy. A movie that's never on anymore is really good, has good music. It's in London. You're, you're a badass rower. It's basically a Tom Cruise part. It's yeah. It's the upstart badass. He's yeah. he's his own worst enemy. He's so cocky, he believes in himself. Uh, everybody else instantly rebels against him. It's yeah, just yeah. the whole recipe. It's good. It still kind of holds up. I, it might be the best rowing movie. I don't know. Some people say Chariots of Fire. But sure, it won I, a couple Oscars. I don't know. I think it's a toss-up. I, listen, any, any movie that can make sculling slash rowing sexy and fun deserves an Oscar, in my opinion. <laughs> I agree. And, it's very uh, enjoyable. I had the, I had the um, back in those days the studios. Today all the studios are kind of the same, but in those days there was a hierarchy of studios. Like Warner Brothers, if you if you were doing a movie for Warner Brothers, it was likely to be a hit. Um, Hollywood Pictures and Disney came out and they just crushed it. And I had the mis like the misfortune of always working for God bless MGM. Yeah, who could not release. A movie if their life depended on it usually because by the time the movie came out the studio had been sold five times so oxford blues later on a movie called masquerade both movies that are really good you can't find them anywhere because they're probably in bankruptcy court somewhere as collateral masquerade kim cattrall kim cattrall meg tilly right off of the big chill that was later that was late 80s we, we're skipping ahead yes. but that is know, a good one and you're right it's never on Never, because it's MGM. It's frustrating. Uh, yep. You would think in the streaming era, when everybody's trying to build libraries, they would try to kick ass with some of these lost classics. Um, which brings me to our next one in this amazing uh, quadrilogy. Quadri quadrilogy? Quad Quadrants of movies? Quad Quadrology? Like, Quadrology. Yeah. Yeah. 30, 35th anniversary this month. Say no most fire. Oh, boy. 35 years ago, this week. And with the passing of the great Joel Schumacher, our director. Two there days you ago, go. Um, Joel was an amazing man, an amazing director, and really, really, you know, look, Coppola gave me a huge break. But Joel Schumacher was, w gave me the most iconic part I played in the 80s. And for sure, that's Billy and St. Almost Fire. And, you know, they wanted me to play. So that script was around. It, was, it wasn't The Outsiders, but it was close in that the script was out there and every young actor wanted to be in it. It had this kind of buzz and everybody was auditioning and trying to do it. But I'd already done movies and you know, I wasn't auditioning and didn't did have to do any of that stuff. And um, all the, But everybody else in the movie was auditioning and doing it and getting the movie. And because they, you know, it wasn't being like offered to me like the other ones were, I didn't even know about it. Mm. And but I'd heard about it. And then finally somebody was like, You should read this. And I read it and I was like, Oh, this part of Billy's really good. And my agent was like, Well, I'll talk to the studio. And they talked to the studio, and the studio wanted me to play the Judd Nelson part and did not want me to play Billy. In spite of the fact that I was at that moment kind of an it guy, they were like not having it. They were like, not interested. Rob Lowe, Billy Hicks, no. And so I had to go to Joel Schumacher and convince him that I could be a bad boy. So I got fucked up on beer. I brought a six pack into the meeting. And uh, by the time the meeting was over, I had the part. And um, it was one of my favorite movies I've ever done. You know, I remember when the trailer was coming out for it, it had that great music that they would eventually use for uh nba finals and stuff like that they'd use like lakers celtics and you would hear brent musburger being like yep the lakers right. thought after game three that and you would just hear the same almost fire music it had you know the washington dc mid 80s georgetown yeah little the, the little foliage in october and it was mm. just and it was all these actors that at that point we knew all of them except for mary winningham but the other six and a lot of them had been in movies together and different movies. And it was a movie that just made sense. And it, and also like 
you know, people right out of college, I hadn't really seen that movie for a few years. You know, it was a movie that for some reason people weren't making. What happens after you graduate? What do you do? Yeah, it was it truly looking back on it now, it seems obvious, but it wasn't at the time. Nobody had done that movie. It's like the, you know, you've, you've had this great moment in your life and now you're like, okay, now what the fuck? And are we still friends and will we be friends? And, and, and what were our friendships predicated on? And, and look, St. Elmo's Fire has always had a little bit of a, um, like people make fun of it. There's a little bit of a hate watching thing because it's so eighties and it's a lot of it's really, really dated. And, and, and that's all true, but underneath it, it's really about stuff that, um, has, has stood the test of time in spite of the fact that me and hair moose might not have stood the test of time. Your hair that you have an incredible trumpet scene in there or sa oh, I'm sorry, sax scene. Sax. I mean, uh -huh. what, the, you, you got to love it. Like that's how you know it's eighties is there's a <laughs> saxophone solo scene. There's a band built around the saxophone player. It's like, it's a, just wait till you hear his solos. You guys are going to go nuts. <laughs> this guy's a star in waiting. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it was, God, I was trying to do my, my version of Clarence Clemens from the E Street Band. I was like, I, I ripped off every one of his moves, even how he, he strapped the, the horn around his back like a guitar strap instead of putting right. it in front of him. And I just completely ripped that from the big man. Well, the things I loved about that movie that just weren't, and it's a little like the big chill is like this too, which I think is a movie that's now thought of all these years later, probably a little more respectfully, but big chill, same thing. Like, Hey, we, we, we all meant really something important to each other for these four years. And now it's 10, 15 years later. And it's like, I barely know you guys anymore, but I still have this connection. And it and was the same thing with Sin Almost Fire, where it's like, yeah, we were in college, but now we're all going different ways. We still have this connection. We still have this bond. Well, and that's funny because when people ask me about the Brat Pack or the cast of the Outsiders, that's the answer. I would say if you went to college with someone, if you if you were in a sorority or a fraternity and you did all those things and and went through all of that stuff, the, the the Brat Pack and those people and from those movies, they're my fraternity. Right. My fr when I see, when I run into Tom Cruise, he's my fraternity brother. It's what it is. It's like, I don't really know what he's doing now particularly. And he doesn't maybe know what I'm doing. It doesn't make one fucking bit of difference where we're, we were in the same frat. Well, that was the year the Brat, the New York Magazine wrote the Brat Pack piece, mm -hmm. right? That's right. And that that's was on the, the cover. That's it. And it seems like some people have complicated feelings about that. I always liked the Brat Pack, but I, I know there was a stigma to it that, I don't know, do you think ultimately it was it a good thing, a bad thing, or both? Ultimately, it was a good thing, 100%. I think that it didn't engender us to any positive criticisms. I don't think that movie would have ever, or that that genre would have ever been a critic's darling type of thing to begin with. But that But that piece killed us with, polite society in the media mm. and and there were um there were certain members of the of the brat pack who were way 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 more sensitive to that to that kind of stuff and so it really was a they, they didn't love it and hate it in fact hated it there's a couple of folks who won't even participate to this day in conversations about 30 year anniversaries of any of it and um i i take a different view um I, I didn't love it when it came out because, you know, it made us kind of look like unserious party animal uh, guys, which we certainly had that side, but we were, no one was more serious about their acting and their careers than we were. Yeah. But um, looking back on it now, I, I, well, even then, the, like you, you were an audience member. You didn't, you never got the dog whistle underneath it that you're supposed to not like these people. You're like, whoa, Brat Pack, cool. And I think that's what most people, felt they're like they didn't they didn't realize that it was a a winking kind of pejorative that the fancy new york you know beret wearing critic bestowed upon us i think regular people just thought fucking cool i wish i was in the brat pack that's how i felt as a teenager to me it just seemed like jealousy if people were picking it apart because i was just like i like all the movies these people are making so i don't know i don't know why we're bitching about them what uh what from a party standpoint, so you're coming into real prominence here 
and this is the height of the cocaine era, the party era, the whole thing. It's in oh, LA. Yeah, I mean, nobody knows. Nobody knows cocaine is really bad yet. Although we have an idea, Belushi dies in '82. Thank you. This is what I. This is what I keep telling everybody is like, it's hard to imagine today that there was a moment in time where not only was cocaine not bad for you, that like it helped your thinking. Right. It was good for you. It was good for concentration in your brain, and wasn't addicting. I mean, it's not heroin for God's sakes. And it was what successful people did. Yeah. That it was honestly like today's wine. Look, I've been sober now 30 years. So I, and I was never a wine guy, so I don't really know. But what I observe today is this, the sort of wine culture is what cocaine was. It's like, mm. in, in that we're all very refined and very successful. We're going to talk about our cocaine now. And um, I assume, okay, it's from a dentist, actually. It's uh, it's pure Boluvian Bolu- ship. Like, it's the same rigmarole you hear at a restaurant. It's like, oh, this is a, an, an oaky uh, uh, Napa Valley. That's what it was. Nobody thought it was bad. We learned. Right. <laughs> we well, learned. I think I think the Len Bias thing in sports was the turning point oh. for that. That was June '86. But I remember I remember where I was. I was at the, walking up to the <clears throat> to the lunch truck on a movie called uh, Square Dance, and you know no one was a bigger Laker super fan as me and Jack Nicholson. We were the two. Yeah, and and I and somebody told me that he had he had passed away, and I thought, oh my god, and that that was sort of the beginning of it. Yeah. And I think you look back now and you think, I've talked about this before in the podcast, but movies, TV, music, sports, and comedy. So you take those five things and you think of cocaine from 77 to 86 and everybody, and if you're successful, it's, you're doing it the same way like we drink coffee now. You know, yep. and it's like, yeah, I'm a, I have coffee in the morning. It's it's not bad for me. It's fine. They, dude, they it's manageable. Sold it. They sold it on every movie set. Right. I was ever on, ever. You think about that today. Can you imagine? You're working for Amblin Entertainment. You're on Jurassic World. Who's selling the blow? Oh, it's it's uh, a camera department's doing it. Oh, okay, great, thanks. Crazy, but also well, you that... have to understand. Like I also, the people, things are so different. When we were doing Outsiders, Tommy Howell's, I think, fourteen. Yeah. And I was 17 and the legal drinking age in most states was 21. It might've been 18 in Tulsa, but either way, Tommy's 14. We would get in the van after work every day and they would give us a case of beer. Just, Crazy. just, just different, just different time. Yeah. It's pretty fascinating to look back on it. Obviously claim some victims. One other thing was saying almost fire. You know, when you talk about the eighties, how it's, it's honestly one of the most eighties movies. If you're just like, for sure, pick, pick five movies from the eighties and just, and just use them as a way to explain the eighties to somebody who didn't get it. I would probably, they would definitely be one of the five. There's like that crazy Emilio Estevez where he's basically stalks Andy McDowell's character, the whole movie follows her three hours to the ski lodge. And then it's like, it's cool. Oh, all right. It's it, That would be, I think if somebody made that movie and that was a key point of the movie now, people would be like, what the hell is going on? This guy, well, they get, this guy needs they get to a be, res- like, he needs help. Yeah, they get a restraining order. Immediately. After the first scene and there'd be no story. Yeah. So it is definitely dated. Um, all right. Your next one. So you weren't done. Oxford Blues saying almost fire. You're ripping them off now. Then you, then you decide to delve into the world of hockey. Mm. Young bud. Which, mm. a very respected hockey movie in the hockey circles. Um, yeah. Did you know how to skate before the movie? I skated in the way that every Christmas you would go to the local tree cutting down place and put right. on the fi- put on the figure skates mm. and work and work your way around the rink. That was it. So I the answer is no. Um, so I, I trained for that movie so hard. The, the, the legacy of that movie for me is my love of training, mm. which incidentally I didn't love when I started. I hated it. I remember my body felt like I'd been run over by a truck. 
It was brutal. I would I would vomit a lot of times. Uh, skate to the boards and just hurl. Um, it was the first time I ever lifted weights. First, for all of that stuff I learned on Young Blood, and I still do it to this day. But I I trained for probably six to eight weeks, and by the time we shot, I was a really good skater, really really good skater. Still not very good stick handling. So whenever if you when you watch the movie, anytime there's a puck, it's not me. But the rest of the skating is would would all be me. And they would use some intentional slow mo too to make it so, look good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, Swayze's look, in that. You're back with Swayze, and then Keanu with, Keanu Reeves is the goalie. I thought he was an actual goalie. <laughs> yeah. I I I I didn't realize that. That person who never said a word, I thought he was French Canadian. I thought he was a goalie. And it wasn't until many, many years later and many movies later that I realized that it was Keanu Reeves. I never knew, not one day, that that was Keanu Reeves in the movie when I was working with him. That is a respected hockey movie. And what's funny is um, it's basically a Tom Cruise template movie where it's like young hotshot, thinks he's better than everybody needs to come up and has a mentor. Uh Oh, guess what? Something horrible is going to happen to the mentor. Is this guy going to make it? I oh, made it. Well, yeah, let's see if the young hotshot now can carry the load. Like Tom Cruise made that movie five times, but I feel like young blood came before all of them. Oh, no. Oh, don't forget. There's the Matthew Modine movie vision quest. I mean, everybody oh, was doing remember vision. Quest? He's like, he's oh, a wrestler, but I don't know fan. how good a wrestler he is. It's got to drop some weight to fight. Shoot. And he's gonna yeah. have to he's got to wrestle his way to some sort of comeuppance. Um, and then Madonna's gonna be in it singing in the bar, because that's what happens when you're in Pennsylvania and you're a hard scrabble wrestler. Madonna's <laughs> in your bar. She said had to get her. Yeah, it was actually it was worse than Pennsylvania. I think it was like Spokane, Washington. But she was yeah. passing through. She was on tour. Yeah, she's passing through. Singing um, singing crazy for you. It's you just cannot make this up. No. No, it was a good one. Uh, and then the last one about last night, which I think has held up. Yeah, I think too. if you're talking me about rom com recipes, yeah, it's one of the best ones. It's one of the best kind of capturing of how the arc of a relationship and how it can go up and down and how it can get screwed up. And it's very 80s. Um, the whole dynamic of this guy's got a buddy. She's got her buddy, the way they talk separately, they come together. Like it's all shit that's been ripped off now for 35 years. I don't really know what was a version of that before about last night. You you no. might've actually been the first. Cause then when Harry met Sally comes two and a half years later, three years later, and I then always, everybody's like, Oh yeah, let's go. Let's do this thing. It's so funny. You met, it's you're the only person who's ever mentioned it that, that way. Cause I very quietly, have always been like, you know what? Fuck when Harry met Sally. I made that fucking movie. These guys just fucking ripped it off and made it probably better. I don't know. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I love about last night. It's funny. It's really well written. Um, there's just something really special about me, to me and I together in that movie. I agree. And Elizabeth Elizabeth Perkins is she never worked before absolutely genius debut performance and Belushi um Jim created the role on stage before he ever played it in the movie because it was a David Mamet play well it was a famous play that was, and it was a play that I remember when I was in college I was taking a playwriting course it was one of the ones they gave us like read read the dialogue in this this is how you do it and so I was good. like wait this is about last night um yep but yeah all of it uh it's so funny how it basically created the template and gets no kudos. None. No recognition. None, none, none of that zero. stuff. And the it's, whole it's, arc of know. we're in love. Oh, the guy screwed it up. Now he's in the dump. Sad music. Him walking in the rain. Now oh, maybe the, he can win her back. How about the falling in love montage? Oh, yeah. There's some mo- good montages. They, and plus you're using Chicago, too. Yeah, you got Bob Seeger, one of my favorite lost Bob Seeger songs, Living Inside My Her Heart or whatever. Yeah. I mean, there's there's the soundtrack to that, um, the John Waite song at the end. This I actually think the soundtrack to About Last Night is better than the soundtrack to St. Almost Fire. I think I Other agree. Other than with you. the St. Almost Fire actual song St. Almost Fire. I need to tape the 
unedited TV version of it to watch with my daughter because I'm not watching the unedited version. Oh, there. Bro, there's a couple. You, are not you went for it. You got you and Demi Moore went for it a couple times in that movie. Probably not. Uh, we, not that's giving the that other to thing her. is is the in those days, everybody was nude. Everybody and 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 every single movie had to have what we blatantly just called without thinking there's anything wrong with it a sex scene. Every yeah. movie, like when I would get scripts, I would always look on page 73, whatever reason, they were always on page 73. And when you think about it as a writer, it makes perfect sense. Page 73 is sort of mid second act when traditionally it's the doldrums of storytelling. Yeah. So how do you, how do you solve that? I know we will get them naked. So uh, I, I would check the page 73 to see how bad or good, depending on your perspective, it was going to be. But about last night, I mean, we're, we're running like monkeys in that goddamn movie. I think that movie is really good. And people listening to this, I would urge you to go find it on whatever streaming service it landed on, because I do, I really do think it holds up and it really uses Chicago nicely, which is it the is, other it, thing. It's a good Chicago my, movie. It's my favorite. It's my favorite movie that I've ever done. Wow. It is. It's it 100%. People, I love St. Elmo's Fire. People like St. Elmo's Fire. I like, you know, all of the stuff I started to do later, but you know, of, of the stuff I did early in my career, it's not even a close call for me that that would be the one I would have people see. What would be the silver medalist? Outsiders. Just because it's, you know, it's, it's Coppola and it was the first and it, it, it also still is a, a, an evergreen. Can I ask what your life was like, um, from a romantic standpoint, as you're ripping off this run of movies and living in LA, like where were you settled down with people? Were you jumping around? What, like how crazy did it get? It's everything you can imagine and more. Who was um, your competition? Well, Who? Hutton, Hutton did great for himself early on. Like I said, uh, you know, he had, cause he, 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 he played the, uh, well, what would it be? We had very different games, right? I came, I, you know, Hutton came at you with the introspective, sensitive, untucked shirt game. And, and mine was like, this is going to be fun. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, like I was like the Shaquille O'Neal of actors. Like, you know, when you're with Shaq, you know, you're going to have fun. Yeah. Like that's, that sort of was my, my thing. Nobody's going to get hurt. Nobody's going to make any false promises. It is what it is. You only live once. Let's go. And that's, that's the way I lived my, I really did live my life in the eighties. And, and, um, you know, I, I, it was really fun. I gotta be honest. I had a blast. I, I'm glad that I grew up, that I got to the point in my life where I wanted more from life and where, where I put that in its proper perspective. And, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're young and famous and got money and you're, it's the eighties, you know, that's, that's no time to go to the monastery. Right. Matt Dillon's in there too. Oh, like I said, I learned everything I ever needed to learn from the goat. Wait. So when you saw like, so 10 years later, Leo's hits. Oh, it's funny. I think about that a lot. I think about, cause you know, he's, he's so, on Mount Rush. He's on Mount Rushmore. Nobody wait, comes so, to Leo. You're like Nobody. the old, but you're like on the NBA team. You're like the veteran at that point. You're, you're yeah, like sure. Chris Bosh, 10 years in the league, watching the new rookie come in and go, Oh, look at this, this guy. Yeah, what, well, because and the other part of it is that we, when I was coming up, the guy, the ultimate guy that I admired was the goat of all goats. And that was Warren Beatty. Mm. who no, no one will ever have a run like he had. And, that, and that was kind of baked into what you aspired to. It's like, I'm not sure that it was all that healthy to be out running around as much as, as I did, but that's what my hero did. And he was winning Oscars. So, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I want to be Warren Beatty. Right. And I think, and I think that all comes, they're still out there. And, and, you know, I, I gotta say the, the, uh, the retired old Yoda in me um, is, is very bemused to sit back, uh, sit back and watch young Mr. DiCaprio. I doff my hat. <laughs> when you aged out of like those kind of 
college, young adult type of movies. And I thought it was really interesting how you shifted and you started making movies like Mass Grave. But then when you started doing the SNL stuff, yeah, that was when I felt like you recreated what I thought of you and what I thought your arc was going to be. Because I think a lot of people who succeeded in the 80s, it kind of stayed in the 80s and it was hard to kind of evolve. And the the shocking thing for me was the first time you hosted SNL. And Thank it was you. Like, I'm so glad you watched that. That's cool. Oh my God, I, I was that. a huge SNL guy. But you did... um. Did you do you did the Arsenio sketch, right? Where yes. you had the long fingers and um, but the the whole episode where it was just like, wait, wait, Rob Lowe's funny? Where when did this happen? I had no idea. And just being shocked by it. And then that led to you being in some of the Lorne Michaels movies and all that stuff. But yeah, you must have been frustrated that people didn't see you that way. I I, I there was a little bit of that because I was I was a Saturday Night Live fan from day one. Everything I ever learned about comedy, I learned from watching that show. Like I was obsessed with it like you were. And then I got to host it. And and one of the things that probably is the most fulfilling things in my career was that Lauren Michaels, you know, of all people, was like, you know what? You're funny. You're a funny fucker. And I felt like I'd been knighted by the Queen of England, the King of England. And, um, and it was so fulfilling for me. And that led, as you, as you say, it led to, you know, the Austin powers, the Wayne's worlds, the Tommy boys, and all of that, that stuff that I can continue to do is all because of Lauren. And, um, and I can't, I couldn't have found a better, a better person to sort of give me my credentials than Lauren. It was kind of the rich man's Ted McGinley part that we grew up with in the seventies, right? That the handsome guy is kind of a dick. Yeah. And I did. That was, if, if there's, if there's any, what's the word I'm like sort of hesitation I have about all those movies is that it was such a cottage industry of rich, handsome Dick, which is why I always liked Tommy boy a lot because it was still in that genre, but he was like white trash, a grifter, a hustler, <laughs> right. And it, it wasn't like smooth Mr. Ferrari guy from Wayne's World. We just did, we do the podca- podcast on The Ringer called The Rewatchables, where we re- rewatch old movies that we've seen a million times. And we did Tommy Boy a couple months ago. And uh, to me, it's like the perfect comedy. It's Chris Farley, obviously his greatest moment that's been captured. It's perfect use of him. I love when people go on road trips. All the side characters are perfect. Like it's just, it hits every check mark. And what's weird is it wasn't considered that successful when it came out, but now it's beloved. And it's so funny how that happens sometimes with comedies where it just it's almost like a bottle of wine. It has to ferment and, and yeah. kind of or whatever. It does. It's amazing. And I'm I'm thrilled to to be a part of it because it I, I just because I know intimately how it came about, what it was like to shoot, how it was perceived when it came out, that now, day in and day out, when pe- when I see how much Tommy Boy means to people, it blows my mind because I'm like Tommy Boy, and like in in, our, in like sort of the cone of silence when Spade and I are together, we're like, you fucking believe it, fucking Tommy Boy, but right, it is it is a really, I, I think the key is Spade and Farley's their charisma and their true friendship and their weird modern day um laurel and hardy is just so undeniable it's so undeniable and so great and they're they're acting i mean the right. the dramatic stuff in there is really touching and those two guys crush it in that movie was it weird to be a dick to chris farley who by all accounts was the most likable human being who ever existed it, it was it, i had so much fun playing that part i mean farley was Farley was great, but I knew I knew I was going to have a blast when I think it's the best entrance my any character I have ever played has in Tommy Boy, where I on the bus, I get off the bus. The kid behind me is making faces at me, a sweet little kid. And I fucking punch the window right in his face and then squeeze up the milk I'm drinking and throw it in a passing baby buggy. Yeah, I'm like this is awesome. What what made you? You said you've been sober for thirty years. What made you? Uh, what made you become sober? Was did you hit a point where you couldn't? Did, were you falling apart, or what was going on? 
I did. I look, everybody who who gets sober at some point reaches a bottom, and and some people's are 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 worse than others. You know, I I was never a, the kind of guy that got all that that drank or got fucked up on set ever. Uh, I'm 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 I am a professional pleasure to have in class. Yeah, and, and, and always have been. Um, but I was like, work hard, play hard, was was my motto. And you know, I I, I got to that age. I was about, I was twenty six. And I started thinking about what I really wanted for my life. And I couldn't keep it together to have a, a real relationship with any one woman. And I, and that was a big part of it. I knew that I, that if I was still carousing, that was never going to happen. Um, I had turned 26 and was just looking at my life and melancholy. My grandfather had just died. Um, and I had a sort of like, is this all there is? And, you know, moment and um i knew a couple people who'd gotten sober and they it had changed their lives and so um i did it i went to rehab for a month it was the greatest thing i ever did i had a by the way i had a blast there Mm. uh i know it sounds shocking but i learned so much about why i was the way i was and it was it just was i was ecstatic to finally be like oh i don't have to do this anymore um, cause for me where it ended, people say, what was your bottom? Here's my bottom. You'll love this. My bottom was Monday night football. Monday night football became the bane of my fucking existence because it would be like, yo, Monday night football, come on guys. And we would all go over to my house and we'd all watch Monday night football. And we'd be drinking like you do. And then everybody would leave. I guess who'd still be drinking. Mm. And then it would be some more of this. And then I'd call somebody else and then they'd come over and then. So Monday night football often for me became Wednesday morning nightmare. So uh, that was not good. And, um, you know, being, being sober now 30 years is, uh, you know, it's given me everything, everything good in my life. You know, my wife, my family, my kids, my career. Um, and uh, I, I, I can't recommend it highly enough to, to people if they're out there and contemplating it. And here's the one thing, and then I'll stop my soapbox. The thing that kept me for, for from for the longest time uh from getting sober was i thought my life would be over ironically mm. i thought i literally thought well, wait a minute so the lakers are gonna win a final and i'm not gonna have a champagne what if i ever have a kid i'm not gonna like have a glass of you know whiskey with my bros what am i gonna do on the fourth of july i'm gonna be boring boring and and that thinking kept me from pulling the trigger for years and years and years and I've had way more fun sober this amount of time than I ever did in the 80s. And that's saying something. Interesting. Where where were you living in your heyday in the 80s? Oh, or was it multiple places? Oh, bro. This, this tells you all you need to know. The very first house I ever bought, it was in the Hollywood Hills. And I remember buying it because it was 12 minutes from the Hard Rock Cafe. Mm. If that isn't the most embarrassing, mortifying, and insightful look into the thinking. What street What street are we talking? I was How far Nichols, down are we? Nichols Canyon. I was oh, up, in, up in Nichols Canyon. It was very Hotel California. It was like, it when you walked into the doors of that house, you knew exactly what the future for you was going to be. <laughs> was it like... <laughs> Was it over the top, like a big portrait of yourself in the living room? And no, like, so, no, 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 no. It was, it was. I mean, I, I not to pop myself. It's a party house. I think, I, I think I've always had pretty good taste. It was, it good. was very um, Adrian Line. Oh yeah. Meets Miami Vice. Great. So like Michael Mann could have shot a movie. One hundred percent. One hundred percent, Michael Mann. Exactly. That's exactly what it was like. In fact. When I sold it, I sold it to an Oscar-winning production designer. Hmm. Um, can we talk Lakers really quick? Oh, yeah. All right. I think we should end on this. Because I, I want you to come back. I want to save some stuff for the next time. Um, yeah, we have to. You were you were there for a bunch. And I know you talked to Magic Johnson on your podcast. You were there for a bunch of the good ones in the 80s, so the glory days. Y- you have to, Bill, have to, to download my podcast next week magic because i don't know if you ever have this in your life where you go hey am i crazy or did such and such happen Mm. 
you know, as time goes on, you, you go, I'm imagining this, or I'm making more of this than it actually was, right? So as I think about my time with the Lakers, I thought, I, I, I'm imagining it. It was never really like that, or was it? And then I get magic on the podcast, and we start going down the rabbit hole together. Yeah. And it is every bit of what I remember and more. It was extraordinary to be a part of that. And by the way, to be a part of it, I act like I had a triple double. I was a fucking guy who had a ticket. That's all I was. But I was friends with all of them. I was I traveled on the road with with the team. If I wasn't shooting a movie, you know, I would I would fill my social time um with with um, you know, basketball. I loved it. You never get credit when they rattle off all the celebrities from the Lakers era. It's always that the default is always Jack Nicholson, Diane Cannon, um, no. Flea. Flea gets in there. Not, not a lot of Rob Lowe. You need I need know. different PR for your basketball fandom. Well, I uh, I introduced to the court Exhibit A, the testimony of Magic Johnson, and he will tell you. <laughs> you know, I got banned from the hotel by Pat Riley. That's a badge of honor. Wait, Bam. <laughs> because he was worried about your influence on some of his players? 100%. With, with the, uh, the first Pistons final, in those days, the format was you were, it was like 2-3-2 two, two or whatever. Yeah. So you'd, you'd be stuck oh, on yeah. the road for like a, like a week. It just was forever. So we're in, you know, out in, in, you know, the, it was the Superdome then. And we're out in whatever, hotel out, out outskirts that we are and you know the, the the fans would show up and the girls would show up and riley would just look at me and shake his head like you little fucker and finally they they banned me from staying the same hotel as 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 the lakers and as magic pointed out on the podcast which made me laugh he goes yeah i remember that because you they they made you we couldn't be with our wives either so they put you in the hotel with the wives. I thought, well, that isn't the smartest plan either. <laughs> <laughs> who was who was the most fun Laker other than Magic? Oh, Michael Cooper. Come on. Really? Michael oh, Cooper? I wouldn't have guessed oh, yeah. that. Oh yeah. He was my he was my other run at like he he was the guy who would, you know, hit Mr. Chow's with you at midnight after the game. Michael Cooper. Hmm. I wouldn't have guessed I, that one. I um, I went out with Michael Cooper after, and you can do the stats on this one. It's a, it's the it's the Detroit series, and I had him out late. That's all I'm going to say. He promptly went on a zero for like forty shooting tear <laughs> to end the to end the finals. That's why Riley didn't like me around. It's probably the right move. Did Kareem like you or no? Kareem didn't didn't like a lot of yeah. people. Captain, I love the captain. And captain is people describe ask me like what's Kareem like? And he and this is Kareem. Like, let's say you crash landed in Antarctica and you barely survive for three months, and you're walking across through a blinding, freezing Arctic snowstorm and there's a, another fucking human being there. And it's getting closer and closer and you go, oh my fucking God, that's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You'd be like, fuck! Thank you, Kareem! And Kareem would go, hey, how you doing? That's right. Kareem. If you ran into Kareem in our in our he'd be like, hey, how are you? He's very low-key. And um, he was very much kept to himself. Um, but the, the the great move I learned from Kareem was early on before the Lakers had a their own plane and they flew commercial, which wasn't often. Kareem would put a blanket over his entire body and sit there like a ghost. So you can imagine he's seven four. Yeah. With like a blanket on him, just as people are filing in, getting their seats, putting their luggage on. He's just got a blanket over his entire face, body. I was like, that's a good move. That's a good way to disappear. I did I spent a year with Magic because we did TV together. And we would, you know, we, sometimes we'd show up, we'd have like eight hours cause we'd be doing double headers. You'd have to come on the halftime. So we'd be, it'd be me, him, Jalen and Wilbon. Right. And, and I was just, and I had the seat right next to him watching all these games 
and we were bored. And it was just like, I'm just going to ask magic questions. And I would just ask him. So we would talk about Kareem sometimes. And it was so interesting hearing him talk about Kareem. Like it was still like a big brother, older person, person he respected. And meanwhile, magic's like one of the most successful, uh, ex athletes of all time. He runs a company, but the way he talked about Kareem was still like, almost like he's talking about his dad. Um, well, you know, it's that, that's that interesting thing that people like, if someone was famous before you got famous, let's say, and then maybe they never work again and you're uber famous when you meet them to you, they're still the top dog. Totally. So, so it's that thing is like, he's magic will forever be the rookie that jumped into Kareem's arms at the end of the buzzer beater in San Diego in that first season. And Kareem totally. will be, will be the, the legend who goes easy kid. It's a long season. It's my favorite story. Well, yeah, it was a great one. Um, he told this, I hope I'm not talking at school. He told this story about when the, the famous game, when he wins, when he plays center, cause Kareem sprains his ankle and Kareem mm -hmm. doesn't go to Philly with them. They're up 3-2. They win the 1980 finals. Magic has his iconic game. And he was saying the plane lands back in LA and Kareem, Kareem's waiting for them and goes on the plane and was so happy. And, and he was just like, I couldn't believe, man, Cap, seeing Cap like that, I just, just, he just didn't get like that. And he was just so happy and he's hugging people and it was, and it was like that meant more to magic than winning the finals MVP that he had like pleased Kareem. Yeah. And it was, so it was a hundred percent genuine, you know? And, uh, I was, I always really liked their relationship. He's magic's a great guy. I'm, I'm still pro magic. We oh. only spent a year together, but he, uh, he was so much fun to talk to and was such a resource on seventies, eighties, nineties basketball, you know, cause in the seventies, he's playing college, but he's playing. It's all the NBA players during the summer. So he had this whole. I coached encyclopedia. His, his, uh, his, his famous game that he used to have every summer at the, um, it was, a, a, a oh, the charity Nights, game. Midsummer Nights Magic. It was called for the, uh, uh, United Negro college fund. And he raised a ton of money and everybody showed for him. If magic called you, you showed. And I remember the first time magic and Jordan ever played basketball together. I was coach. I was their coach. I didn't have much to say to them other than be better. Um, right. and I think, I, I, I think <laughs> that that team scored 149 points. I mean, no, no, sorry. More like 200, it, whatever right. it was, it, there was no defense involved. None. You know, so we had talked about doing a documentary about those, those games. Really? Cause magic that year we spent together, magic would always talk about, man, if we ever got all the tapes to those games and we kind of kicked oh. the tires on it. We couldn't figure out what the story was, but it was, he was just like every year I had the best players in the league and all of the celebrities and we would all have this game. And I think we videotaped it and we were like, what? Um, so we definitely, uh, checked out. What I was remember, the best? Oh, go ahead. I remember when there was a, I remember, uh, I can't imagine this is how bad a coach I was at some point in the game. I had magic and Jordan on the bench. Next oh, to Jesus. Me. Clearly, I must not have been any good. But the reason I remember it was Carl Malone, who was a rookie that year, I believe, came flying down on the wing right in front of us as we were sitting there. And it was like a, a train going by, you know, when the air goes by after. And he like ruffled our hair. <laughs> wow. And I'll, and I'll never forget. There's a beat of silence and uh, Magic turned to Michael and goes, would you ever take a charge from that man? And Michael looked at him and said, fuck no. Well, and then Carl Malone learned how to put his knee up as he did that too. So he was basically like, you're staying out of my way or you're getting yeah. a knee really hard in their chest. What was the best Laker game you ever went to? Just out of curiosity. What's the uh, number I, one? I, I mean, it has to be the baby hook game in the Boston, Boston garden. I was at that um, game. You went to that game. Yep. I, and I tell the story on the podcast. It's, it's really kind of a insane story in my, about how I got there. Cause I had to, I had to get, I had to be taken out on a Zodiac in Long Island Sound under a blanket for a seaplane to get me. So the people making the movie didn't know I was leaving. Oh my and, God. Oh, it's crazy. And then I get there just to tip off and I'm seated next to ML Carr and we start fighting. And so then I have to be taken out of the stands and then they take <laughs> me up to the, 
Celtics <laughs> owner's box of all places. And Irvin had never heard this story. Yeah. And so I'm sharing this with him on the podcast. He was like, wait, you were with the owners of the Celtics? I'm like, yes. And I said, do you remember we were down 14? He goes, oh, yeah. And I'll never forget Michael Cooper being wide open. And and in, in those days, nobody shot three-pointers. And if you shot a three-pointer with nobody under the basket, you were sitting your ass down for the next two minutes. That's how different the NBA is now. But Coop pulls up with nobody around the basket, drains a three, and I turn to the owners of the Celtics and I said, we're going to win this game. And then, of course, Magic hit the famous baby hook. And so that's Yeah, but sure you, thought, you thought Bird shot was going in at the end, though. One, I'll tell you, how, not only did I think it was going in, because the old garden was so steep, the, 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 the boxes were so high up, I could look directly down into the cylinder. That's yeah. how high up they were. So when Bird took that shot, and we talked about this too, that shot I thought was going in. Me too. It did go in and out, I, but when it left his hand, I thought we're fucked. We, um, that's my toughest loss. I'm a, as a diehard Celtic fan, I was sitting mid court. I was on line with the shot. So I'm sitting, he's releasing in the basket and it's dead on. And he Head missed on. it by a thumb, a thumbnail. But, and the crowd had like the loudest, <sighs> like, and then it, was, it just went silent. It was, there's never been a game like that. There's never been a game like that, right? No, because the Celtics, they were defending champs. They lose Len Bias, all the injuries, and they're just fighting and fighting and fighting. And that Laker team was so good. And it really just seemed like, oh my God, we might steal this game. It, and, and then the sky, I mean, the key to the sky hook was the miss Kareem free throw where Michael Thompson goes over Mikhail's back and they don't call the foul. I, I'll never get over that. No call. It's, no, it still it hurts. Not a it still no hurts. Call. That was a no call. It was a foul. You got called. Wait, so you're trying Over to the tell back. me in that you're trying Tainted. to tell me in that era of basketball. Yeah, I am. That that you want a a ticky tack foul yes. call. We're in Boston. You're in our house. We get that call. That's <laughs> amazing. Uh, you keep you keep dreaming. Why why weren't you ever in a basketball movie, or were you? And I don't remember it. What would it have been? Uh, there was never one done while I was. I mean, Hoosiers. I would have been too old. Um. And what blue chip? Blue chips. You he could have been like a hotshot GM, who's his own worst enemy. You could have done like the, I the could, Oxford I, I Blues could, blueprint. Well, you know, I'm I'm developing the Rob Polinka story. I'm you know, I'll play Rob Polinka. That's so weird. I, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. You're the Lakers GM who's who looks like you. This team that you loved, and now the GM is like you could you could go out as brothers. Um, I actually, we did an event for like season ticket holders, Jeannie, but, and I've known the bus family forever, obviously. And Jeannie said, Hey, why don't you come on and do a, a bit? So they had all the season ticket holders and she kept saying, Rob's going to come out and talk to you about the season. Rob's got a lot of ideas about the players, you know, Rob. And then I came out that <laughs> I was going to be pulling it. it was oh, great. that's great. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. Listen, I really appreciate this. This was really fun. I could talk to you for seven hours. Uh, good yeah, luck with your too. podcast. Good luck with the, uh, you're do still doing the Fox show, right? Oh yeah, I got um, um, Mental Samurai, which is my competition show, and uh, a nine one one Lone Star, both coming back uh, next year. Staying busy. Uh, pleasure talking to you. Nice to finally meet you. Good luck with everything. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it again, man. Thank you, brother.